shopping on an ad agency, I'm usually not an interviewer. But being a board member of Manhattan Chamber, when we created this Manhattan Chamber of Women of Influence, we had Joy Gordon in mind. It, beyond fabulousness, okay? Joy is absolutely a life changer. And I want to say that you can look at her and you can feel her energy and you can feel her warmth. But what she has done, so I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to interview her, and it's been like 60 minutes, I'm going to go up to her office. If everyone in this room does not go up to Dress for Success office in the next month, you're crazy. Because it is probably one of the most important things we can do for women. She is a super, super accomplished lawyer, has won loads of awards. She has now become a non for profit leader uh, the last 18 years. You're a, you're a non for profit leader longer than you were a lawyer, right? Four times. Four times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Joy is a visionary. I mean, she really is a visionary. What she has done with Dress for Success is just, we want her to tell time to edit. She has won more accolades and more awards than we have time for. And you should look on her bio because it is just incredible and it spans everything. The success of Dress for Success is really attributed to Joy Ford. And the teams that she's built, her leadership, her spirit, her smarts, and just, I have to say, it's going up there, her all-around wonderfulness. So I want a big applause for Joy. I want to ask a question. Then we're going to encourage you to ask questions. But this is like an organization that girls, we all have to get involved in this. Okay, first, Joy. <laughs> Describe your job as CEO of Dress for Success Worldwide. So first, let me just say, that was an awesome introduction. Uh, now I have to live up to it. Uh, that's, that's stressful. Um, and, um, and I appreciate it, because it means a lot. And everything you said about our organization is exactly true. So Dress for Success, how many of you have heard of our organization in the room? How many have never heard of Dress for Success? See, oh and I say God. this all the time. There's always one person. Right. And you said what? I'm French. And I said, yeah. and the person's not from New York. <laughs> so wait, your job tonight is to Twitter about it. Exactly. Exactly. And that's my thing. Like, I can walk up and down the street and ask people, have you heard of Dress for Success? And nine out of ten will say yes, and proudly they're donors of our organization. They've donated suit, shoes, handbags, something over the years. And so they proudly wear that badge of being a donor, and there's always one who's never heard of it, but she's not from New York, I said. So, yeah, right? Um, so this is an organization that actually started in New York City now 18 years ago, not by me, but by a very bright law student by the name of Nancy Loveland. Um, Nancy has now gone on to do other really marvelous things, and if you haven't invited her to the chamber, I suggest you do so. She now runs an organization called Do Something. But Nancy started Dress for Success with an inheritance from her great-grandfather, $5,000. And here's this young girl in her second year in law school with a $5,000 check that comes in the mail from her great-grandfather, Poppy Max. And the first thing she thinks about doing, um, and, you know, mind you, I went to law school, so a check of $5,000 in the mail when you're in law school, I'd have spent it. But uh, <laughs> not Nancy. She met with two nuns in Harlem. One has since um, deceased, Sister Mary Nerney, but um, met with these two nuns in Harlem, which were really focused on helping women get out of prison. And so Nancy said, what can I do with $5,000 that can make a difference in the lives of women? And it was really Sister Mary Nerney and Sister Catherine that said, um, there, wouldn't it be smart if there was an organization that gave clothes to women who needed it? Um, and women come out of prison, they have nothing to wear, but yet they're expected to find jobs. So what if there was this organization that gave suits to women who needed it for interviews? And they came up with this great name called Dress for Success. Nancy had never heard of it. Nancy had never worked before. She never read the book by John Malloy, Dress for Success in the 70s and 80s. But Nancy, Sister Mary Nerney and Sister Catherine did. And they really did believe that you could change a woman's life by helping her look good on the outside. I came on board about a year after Nancy started the organization. I saw it on the news, and I thought, what a great organization. I'm going to donate a suit. And as a lawyer, I had a closet full of suits, so that was going to be easy. I'd say this, I jokingly talk about how I called the office, Dress for Success, that same day at about 8.30 p.m. 
because I did not want to talk to anyone, right? So you usually call when you know people are gone. <laughs> um, and so I called uh, expecting to get the voicemail, to leave my name, and somebody call me back and get my suits. And Nancy answered the phone. So I was like, oh my God, I wasn't expecting anybody to pick up the phone. I was going to leave a message. And she said, I was on the news this morning. I said, I saw you. And she said, oh my God. I said, I want to donate a suit. She said, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a lawyer. She said, I need a lawyer on the board. And so I joined the board of Dress for Success. And I really did. I joined the board of Dress for Success over a phone call. And within a year, I left what I was doing because I was more passionate about working in the basement of a church and serving women than I was about, um, at the time, being an assistant district attorney and prosecuting people in the Bronx. And, um, and never looking back, it's been 17 wonderful years, and we have helped over 750,000 women land jobs around the world. So the power of one woman with $5,000 she has transformed, this organization has transformed women's lives, and quite frankly, most of our women are single moms, so if you help her, you help her entire family. Um, Can you and, tell us about the process? Yeah, so tell the process is wonderful, and in the room are a couple of our nonprofit partners that refer clients to us, so we can't do it alone. This isn't a joy project, this is about thousands of nonprofit organizations that serve our communities, and they do a lot of the hard work. So they'll do the hard skills training and, and get a woman ready for an interview. And about 48, 72 hours before her interview, she's referred to us for her suit. And so we see her in her most nervous self. And in many cases, she still lacks a lot of uh, self-esteem and self-worth. Um, she's not sure about herself. Her confidence is low. And really, our job, our responsibility, in that 30 minutes to an hour to three hours, however long it takes, is to build up her self-worth. So we like to say that we suit her from the inside first, and then we suit the outside. Because a lot of the inside is broken. Um, and she doesn't expect much when she comes to dress for success. And it was beautiful when Beth was able to come to our office because we take a lot of pride in making sure that the space is beautiful. We'll study the department store. Um, and we're very lucky because the, you know, the best, one of the best department stores in New York City um, Lord and Taylor came, gutted our space, and redesigned it for us. Um, Richard Baker, I thank him for that. Um, and, and so we want to make sure that when she walks through the door, that she's greeted by someone who knows her by her first name, and that she's treated with dignity and respect. And we talk about where she's interviewing, we do a mock interview with her, we review her resume, and we coach her for her interview. And then we suit her for the interview. And sometimes it happens in reverse, but a lot of that is about just understanding where she's at and building off of that. And um, the beauty is, is that Heidi talked to me about, um, Heidi from the law firm here talked to me about some of the work that she's been doing with Dress for Success over the years um, as a volunteer. So there's so many opportunities to get involved, whether you want to be in our boutique and work one-on-one -on -one with a woman or review her resume or do a mock interview, or as Heidi has done, spoken at our financial literacy programs about bankruptcy or whatever your area of expertise is. And the, the beauty of Dress for Success is that our door is wide open for any woman, not just the woman who needs the suit, but the woman who gives the suit, for the woman who gives her time. Um, for a lot of our women, if they had someone like you in their life, they wouldn't be in the situation they're in. There's just a void in their life with a woman who's strong and powerful and confident and certain and so they don't have a you to go to for that level of support. And so they come to Dress for Success. And it's where they meet you. And then they have you. So that's Dress. Did you tell me how many people you've dressed? Almost a million so people. So almost a million people. Probably close, very close to a million people now because we do our stats every year. And on average, we serve about 70,000 women every year. We, again, started in this basement of a church on West 4th Street. Today we have... 138 offices in 18 countries. Um, and uh, a larger majority of our growth and expansion um, has happened under my leadership um, and moved the organization from being about clothing to be being about building self-worth and helping her start to thrive in her work and in her life and creating real wraparound services for working women. So we pride ourselves in mimicking and mirroring organizations like this. Um, on any given day, in any given city around the world, there's a group going on. 
And in that group are women who came through the Dress for Success door, and now they're members of our professional women's group. So they meet, they have speakers, they learn, they engage, they build their professional development toolkit, um, and they really start to thrive. And so we really work to try to mimic this like organization in every city we're in to really help develop women and have them be their best self. So we can tell that you really are not engaged in your job. So no. <laughs> what do you enjoy most about your job? Look at the smile. It's like you feel it. It's just, it's, and, and, and the people that she dress, they yeah. feel it. You have to go there to see it. And so what, what's the one thing you have to one? And, you know, it, obviously the women. I mean, the women light you up, right? And, and you know, and, and my job and what I do running the worldwide headquarters for Dress for Success, sometimes I don't get to see the women. And so sometimes, even if I'm on the seventh floor, which is headquarters, I might not even get down to six. But sometimes, I'll meet a woman in the elevator. And I will tell you, because I come in on seven, and she gets in on six, so she has no idea that I'm connected to six. And I, I sometimes I over, I listen to her on her cell phone talking about what just happened on six. Sometimes I watch her look through her bag in the elevator as she starts to pull out items that we've given her. Sometimes I watch her cry in the elevator. And I'll never forget that this woman said to me once, she got in on six, and there I was, I got, I got on seven, stopped at six, she gets in on six, and she says, she's just, just filled up with emotion. And I said, did you get a lot of good stuff? And she said, have you ever met the people on six? <laughs> I was like, you know, have you ever met Dress for Success? And I said, I, I met them. And she said, what I got isn't in the bag. She was oh. like, those people. She was like, no one ever asked me where I came from. No one ever judged me based on my past. She's like, those women in that place, they are amazing. And, um, and I said, well, I wish you well on your interview. She said, and I hear that if I get my job, I get to come back for a week's worth of clothing. Unbelievable. <laughs> and, uh, and then I get to join their professional women's group program. But talk more about that. And, and I, I thought, what an ambassador for the work that we're doing. So the beauty of Dress for Success is it doesn't have to be here in New York City. In 138 cities around the world, that same DNA in our organization is done. That same feeling that we give to a woman, that we, we greet her and we meet her where she is. and we call her by her first name, and she calls us by our first name. There's no hierarchy in Dress for Success. You don't call me Miss Gordon or Miss Joy. You just call me Joy. And you treat somebody with dignity and respect. And for many women who walk through our doors, they have never felt that before, right? And sometimes it's the small things you do. And I know it's the power of words, because I'm a mother. <laughs> so I'm very conscious of the words that I say to my children, and I'm very conscious of the words I say to the women. So sometimes when I'm walking through the boutique and I'll see a woman standing in the mirror, I'll just say, God, you're beautiful. And I'll just keep it moving. And they'll say, who was that woman? And just said, I was, no one's ever called me beautiful. And so many of us in that room, we've heard these words. We've heard strong words. We've heard that we're smart and we're confident and we're leaders, but how about if you've never heard that word before and someone says it to you, how empowering that is. So that's the dress for success that most people don't know about and it's the work that we get to do to lift up women. Um, but the interesting part is that the organization has shifted. In 1997, we were a welfare to work organization. Most of our clients came from welfare. Most of our clients were second, third generation <coughs> welfare recipients. Shockingly, it is not surprising to see women walk through our doors who look like women in this room, who are women who have accomplished women, women who have worked, women who maybe, for whatever reason, just right now are unemployed. And so they too need help. They too need to be lifted up. And so it's not surprising when a woman says to me, I remember Dress for Success when I used to work at XYZ Bank, and I used to conduct the suit drives, and I was there 20 years, and I got downsized and I've been unemployed for two years and now I'm filing for bankruptcy. Now my home is in foreclosure. Now I'm living on a friend's couch and now I need that same organization I used to give my suits to. So um, it needs to be an organization for all women. I don't think we created it for that purpose, but today it is. It's an organization that any woman could come to and get the support she needs when she's looking for work. So that brings up a good question. What do you think has added to your professional success? 
What do you think some of the key factors for you are? So the who that has added to my professional success is my husband. Um, because pretty early on in our marriage, um, he allowed me to just soar. And it made him take a back seat in his business to allow me to do dress for success. And so raising two children, and he owned a limousine company, and back in the day we owned a travel agency. And he just, he started to sell off his cars, and he started to focus on the family, which allowed me to travel and to build this brand. Um, so the who that has led to my professional success is my husband. Um, but many women have helped me along the way. Um, and I have a stellar board of directors. I try to find the most intelligent, witty, funny, loving group of men and women around the world to join the board of directors. And then they teach me to be a better leader. And they help guide me and put me in the right space to lead and grow this organization. So there's a lot of people that I owe a lot to in helping me move from being this young lawyer in New York City who never did fundraising, who never thought of working for a nonprofit, to feel like I could do it, and then do it well enough that it's now become this global nonprofit NGO so the world. So you have inspired over million women, okay? That's a big number. And we're going to France next, so I hope you're tweeting. <laughs> so I have a yeah, question. We need to reopen. We have an office in Paris, but we need to we need some different leadership. <laughs> <laughs> a ladder? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Who is your role model? Uh so there's there, there's uh, a number of corporate women who run um, significant businesses unrelated to nonprofits that are role models for me. There's a woman by the name of Nikki Landakis who runs Commune Hotel and Resort. Can you love me now? And I, I just admire the way she leads. I admire the way she, at one point, used to run Kimpton Hotels and Resort. And Kimpton's, you know, 70 Park and Aventi, and there's a number of properties. And they're our hotel partner. And I would go into the hotel with her and I would just watch how people would connect with her and how she treated people and they had such a great deal of respect for her. And she had a great deal of respect for the people that she worked around. So I tried to emulate that. I tried to, with my team, um, tr treat, treat everybody like team players. Um, there's no, I try to diminish the hierarchy in staff. Um, and so I, I look at great women who lead and I try to emulate that. But I'll tell you my biggest role model is my mother. And that seems so simple, but when you're raised by a single mom, and I'm an only child, and she made it clear when she decided to have me that she was gonna, she was all in. And so she worked three jobs to put me through private school, right? And um, she Where'd went. You grow up? I grew up in Brooklyn, but then she moved me to Oklahoma because I was getting a little too fast. Uh, so she, and I appreciate that because she saw, or neighbors told her, that I had way too much company during the daytime after school. And uh, my mother took a transfer and moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma with no family and no friends. We picked up, we moved our bags and left our furniture and moved to Oklahoma. And she started over there by herself. And she went to school at night to get her degree. And then she went to real estate school and I would quiz her for her exams. And she poured it all into me. I was it, I was her only bet. And she would say to me, and my mother would interview for jobs. She worked for American Airlines. And that's how we moved to Tulsa, uh, through American Airlines. But she would, she would interview for jobs constantly. So I feel like this job at Dress for Success was like in my DNA. So my mom would interview for jobs and, she had no business interviewing for it. Like she was not qualified. But every time they would post a job, she would interview for a job. And so our fun night at home would be she'd give me a list of questions and I'd have to do the interview. So I'd say, So tell me a little bit about yourself. And she'd <laughs> tell me a little bit about herself, you know. And then I said, What's your strength? And she'd give me her strength. And what's your weakness? And I use those questions. Oh my God. I was I knew how to interview for a job. At 10, right? So I was ready. Um, and my mother, the last question always was, 
what is your um, greatest accomplishment? I have that down here. And she would say, <laughs> my daughter Joy. Oh. So, but what's your and greatest accomplishment besides your family? Yeah, well, you know, beside my family is taking an organization that started in the basement of a church and growing it into a global, um, you know, that's something to be proud of. <laughs> it just, you know, and and moving it out of being a, a depository of clothing and really helping women thrive in their life. So that's my greatest accomplishment. Is that, um, it, you know, that's where we're going. That's where we're growing. That we are going places, going strong. That's our that's our tagline. But it's it's truly who we are as an organization. So that you know, it's it's that I've been here long enough. Sometimes you can be on a train and get off at the stop before you really get to see it. <laughs> and true. there's been times in my career I thought, who would stay in, I've been here 17 years, so you're like, who stays at a job 17 years? Like, when I first took the job, I told my dad I'd only be here three years. And the, so after that passed, and I was at 10, I kept thinking like, is, should I leave? Should I make a move? Is, is it time? And every time I questioned that, I work hard to redevelop something brand new at Dress for Success, oh, so it becomes okay. a new job for me. So, Joy? Yes. <laughs> if you were sitting here, if you were sitting here a year from now, right. celebrating what a great year it's been, what would those accomplishments be that we're celebrating? Well, I know a year from now, I am definitely going to celebrate the fact that we have moved uh, Dress for Success into both Singapore and Korea. We have yeah. licensing agreements pending. So I'm going to celebrate that because I know it's happened. We've just signed um, um, Legos for Africa, so that's exciting. So it's going to be global expansion for us. Talk about that think, Legos um, for Africa. Well, think? I think, you know, where we were in New York City 18 years ago is exactly where women are around the world. So they're kind of catching up to where American women are going. And so I think that our greatest accomplishment over the next two to three years is going to be globally. It won't be domestic. Um, we're pretty much in every major market that we need to be in. But for small markets, um, I don't see us growing a lot more in America. But I will say that we will have a lot, we'll have double the number of countries that we have today. So if we have 18, I think in two to three years, we'll be in 36 countries easily. Um, and that's going to be exciting, uh, and, and to be able to travel around the world and see women and help women and girls um, is going to be extraordinary. And that, you know, I've been here to, to fulfill a legacy and uh, that I'm very proud of, and that my children, especially my daughter, um, she's very proud of it. I, I do. I less. Yeah, Katie knows. <laughs> City comes into work. She's sheer entertainment for us when she comes into work. She's, Studying to be in public relations, so she loves dress for sickness. She's in Buffalo, Lauren Wright, and uh, yeah, so she's she she loves it, and um, and she's so giving, and I believe she is that way because she grew up with a mom working in the giving space, and so it's made her kind of who she is. So, what are some of the ways that people in this room can get involved in dress for success? So, this is not the final question, but nope, I think we have but, to address that. This but, is very so important. first, obviously, the no-brainer is when you're cleaning out your closet, whether it's in spring or summer or fall, think of us for your work-appropriate clothing and donate it. Um, but I would also suggest, as you mentioned earlier, stop by a dress for success and see it. You know, just come in and stand in the corner and watch it all happen. It's pretty magical <coughs> what will happen. In, a, in, in just 30 minutes or so. And figure out how you can get involved. For some, it may be you know, doing mock interviews with the women or reviewing their resumes or speaking at one of our groups or being a personal shopper in our boutique uh, or being on our walk team or our run team or any ways that you have time or talent and want to give to the organization, um, I welcome that. And then remember that we're no longer the suit. Right, so we need funding, as many nonprofits need. We need support. Um, we need women to be engaged with the mission. Um, and uh, there's so many ways to get involved. But whether you get involved with Dress for Success, I would just say, if you're not involved with a nonprofit in this city, shame on us. There are so many worthy nonprofits that could benefit greatly from your level of talent. 
So you don't necessarily need to be on their board, but do, do boards. <coughs> um, but find them something you're passionate about. So Children, did you, you know, what if you're on loads of boards, and when mm -hmm. I said in the beginning, the list of accomplishments and boards and beyond, I'm not going to read all of them. Mm -hmm. When did you know that Dress for Success was really the one thing you had been into 17 years, 27 years, 30 years? When, what, what was that pivotal point for you? Well, I mean, I got it. I got the suit. I got how I felt in a suit when I put it on in the morning. Right? I knew that when I came to New York as an assistant district attorney and I would stand in front of my mirror and get ready for work, when I put on the suit, I looked and felt different. And I know the power of a suit. And so many of us know the power of a suit. Many of us have owned suits. Many of us still wear suits, although people are saying suits are a dinosaur. People still wear suits. Um, However, uh, if you've never had a suit before, that suit is really just a symbol of success. So when we put it on her, and she's never worn one, it's powerful. And so when I got this opportunity to go to Dress for Success as a new board member and see what this organization does, I fell in love with it. And I have been chasing that very first high that I ever had when a woman looked at me with tears in her eyes and thanked me. Or when I stood in the boutique and tried to help her find shoes and couldn't find any and finally realized we wore the same size and I just gave her my shoes. Um, and she said, do you want me to bring them back tomorrow? And I said, no, they're your shoes. And she said, your shoes are my shoes? And I said, yeah. And I just, it, it felt good. I mean, I could run upstairs and get, you know, we all had 25 pairs of shoes on my desk. <laughs> so, you know, I just went out of my desk and grabbed another pair of shoes. Um, but to say to someone, you look great in a suit, and oh my God, I love the earrings we gave you, and this and that, and say to her, we can't find shoes for you, and say to her, can you just take $10 and go to pay less? And she says, no, I just borrowed 250 to get to you today, to get on the train. And then know that you can do something for someone and make a difference. And so, but, we're going to say something. The joy, it's more than that. She alluded. Oh, sorry? Louder. Who would say I speak so loudly. Okay. It's more than that. Joy did allude to that. It's the way that she changed the dime on that it's about feeling great inside, not just outside. And your whole culture has created that. These women walk out of there and they are like super persons. They're three they, inches taller. Beyond they belief. They stand right. with their head up. Um, and they're just, they're lit up like a Christmas tree. And it is so beautiful to see them with confidence. And it's so different to see them from when they walk in to when they leave out with something so tangible and just the words of encouragement and to touch someone and to say to someone to fix, I'm looking at your scarf because we play with scarves. And the, um, to it looks touch, good, to, don't worry. Right, to, <laughs> to, to, to touch her scarf and to dress her. And for someone to say, I just got out of prison, no one's touched me in five years. Um, you know, we take for granted small things that you can do to empower someone. And that's what Dress for Success does. And it's not through the clothes, it's through our words. It's through our actions, and it's the fact that we genuinely care about every single woman who walks through our door. And I will tell you, as many women who come in who need the suit, they cry the volunteers cry as much as the women we serve. And I'll never forget, I was in Sydney, Australia, not too long ago, and one of the volunteers said, I knew you were coming in, I, I'm dying to ask you a question. Um, and she said, when do I stop crying? And I was like, you don't, who stops crying? This is, you, and she goes, I go home and I'm just weeping to my husband. He's like, well, why do you keep going back? Stop going back, you're crying too much. And she was like, I love it so much. And so, so I know everybody wants to ask a lot of questions, but I see the faces. But I want to ask you one final question. If there is one thing about Dress for Success that you would want people to know, what would it be? One no thing. longer a suit. Not about the suit anymore. That's how we started. It's not who we are today. Um, and so when people say to you, I know that organization, that's the group you give suits to, you say, no, 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 there's so much more than clothing. It's not about the suit anymore. Um, it's about success. And, uh, and that's what we want for the women we serve. And 
um, that's what we're going to get to with her. And we've got a lot of programs, a lot of leadership development, a lot of conferences we put on for our women, civic engagement programs, teach them how to give back. Um, it's just really powerful what we're doing for the women we serve now. So people say, you know us, say, they're not the suit. That's not the suit. So before we ask questions, what we need to do is give Joy a tremendous amount of joy. Nancy, she's the boss, so we'll let her go. Oh, no, you gotta let her Nancy Flager sorry, is guys. the chair of the oh, president. Right here. Sorry. Right. Uh, Joy, you're obviously growing this internationally. What kind of, because many of us in the room have partners from all over the world, what kind of organizations do you look to partner with? How do you decide who to partner with and what city? Can you tell us about just sure. like you're saying you want to go to France? How does that process right. begin? Yeah, so it's very robust. So. Can you imagine that um, our affiliate relations team, which is lean, um, they get about, and Liz tells me this every year because she always wants to impress me with numbers, she's very data driven, they get about 1,200 emails requesting information to start up Dress for Success every year. So that's someone who, you know, an expat that moves to a country that says there's not one here, I want to start it, to um, whomever. And then that, it moves down to when we say, well, we're already there. Thanks for asking. Uh, and then there's someone that says, I want to start it in Tuscaloosa, let's say. And we say, oh, that'd be great. We have nothing really in Alabama, so that would be wonderful. And then they go through a process of doing a business plan. And it's very intense. I mean, we make them do about three, four iterations of a business plan, asking a lot of questions. It's a true business plan. What's your marketing strategy? How are you going to get your funding? Uh, how are you going to develop your board? Where are you going to put the dress for success? Why are you choosing that location? And we ask all the hard questions. And of about 60 business plans that are done annually, we approve about 13. So people go through a lot of work to say, I want to bring a dress for success to my community. And after we really you know, we look at the business plan, we look at their strategy, look at their writing, we look at their communication style, because you know we're giving them license, because our structure, I should say, is that each dress for success is independently run with its own budget and its own board. They license the use of the name from headquarters, which is what I run. So it's very much a franchise model. So I've got to trust that if I give you a license to run a dress for success, that you're going to build it. And so, you know, it's with, you know, faith and prayer and hope and, you know, a couple interviews. But I have to believe that you're capable of taking our brand and building it in your community. So it really, it, it starts organically from the communities. We don't go into a market and say, oh, we want to have a dress for success in Las Vegas, so we're, we're coming to Las Vegas. It's really Las Vegas that would reach out to us and say, we want to bring dress for success to Las Vegas. And then somebody does the hard work. And, and usually for year one, they're not paid uh, by dress for success. So they're not paid by us, but they have to raise the money. Um, sometimes it's easier for some than others, but it really, we've had very few dress for successes closed down. Um, so our process has to be rigorous for us to weed out all the people who would not have been able to keep dress for success in. You want to add a comment to that? Mm -hmm. If that's why you're so successful, because you created this culture and you realize that everything has to be the same, as opposed to just open five million. So right. it's quality, not yes, quantity. Absolutely. And that's a great skill set to have. Lainey. How do people come to you? How do they find you? Through our nonprofit partners. So the, there's a few in the room that do workforce development. So maybe in their zip code, there's a nonprofit organization that does training for disadvantaged, disenfranchised, underemployed, unemployed people. And so she'll go through all of the training, the hard skills, and some of the soft, and she'll be referred to Dress for Success when she has an interview. So I'll know that she's interviewing at this law firm, as opposed to interviewing at the Gap, right? So I'll make sure that, because she's really wanting to work at a law firm, and that's where she's trying to go, that she's dressed for interviewing at a law firm differently than if she would be interviewing at the Gap. Because the Gap look and the law firm look are probably two very different looks. And so we're going to button her up for the law firm and then say to her, if you're not going to continue looking at the law firm, you might want to, you know, take your jacket off on the interview or not, you know, t you know take, it, take it down a notch. But we're, we're, it's all about professional attire. So we know where she's going on our interview. Um, when she gets to dress for success, or the type of industry she's going to be interviewing in, to make sure we appropriately address her for that. 
Wendy? And Catherine? You're a force. I just want to say. Please, just a, just a Please say your name. Mindy Goodfriend. Okay. Hi. Uh, do you have the resources you need, let's say, in New York, to serve all of the people who are out there? We could, you know, in New York City, uh, do you have the resources in New York to serve all the people that are out there who need our services? And so the answer to that is, yeah, we'll serve as many women who walk through our doors. Um, so, but we have the selection process by which she gets to us. So, but there are women who will knock on the door and say, I heard about the rest for success and I hear you give out clothing. And we say, we do, but you have to go through one of our partner agencies. So let's figure out where you live or where you're staying or what shelter you're in. And let me redirect you because if you need a suit, you probably need more than a suit. So we don't want to just give you clothing. You probably need housing, you probably need food, you probably need support. So we're going to reroute you, you're going to give back to us. But let's do some other things first. So yeah, we can serve as many. And in New York City, I have the office here on 31st and Park. But we have a storefront in the Bronx. We have a storefront in Queens. Um, we have a warehouse in Brooklyn. So we can serve as many that can walk through our door. On average, Katie, we probably serve about 5,000 plus in New York City every year. Um, but could do more than that. There are days where no one shows up, right? Um, and you don't get mad at that because you got to realize what it takes for her to get out the door in the morning, a lot more different than what it takes for me to get out the door. Right? There's so many barriers, there's so many things in her head telling her it doesn't matter, you're not gonna land a job, don't go, what kind of clothes are they gonna give you, you don't need that, You know, just stay home. Like All that stuff here keeps her from getting there. So when the woman shows up, she's already a success, like, cause she's got there, she's there. And so now it's, it's now, oh, you're, you're here, we're here, we're together. Uh, thanks for the presentation. You are wonderful. I would, louder, please. I would like to give a shout out to the nuns who are part of this uh, founding story. I didn't know about that. In fact, I was telling my friends about the founding, the five thousand dollars inheritance. I didn't Vincent. know about the nuns, uh -huh. yes. but I want to give a shout out to the nuns. I know they are the unsung heroes. They truly of are. A lot of nonprofit things and great in things. This world. Yes, I agree um, with you. My question is, do you keep in touch with the women who have gotten the Dress for Success inside and yeah. outside? And Yes, because you know. if she joins, because we do financial literacy, we do, we have a MiFi Success program, which is financial capabilities, where we teach her about buying products and getting to the stock market. We have a, a leadership summit where we take one woman from around the world, from every city in which we're in, all expense paid. We take her through a three-day leadership summit and teach her what it means to lead and how to give back to our community. So we stay very, and then we have the women who come to Dress for Success, land the job, and then go into our professional women's group. So they go to monthly meetings for the rest of their life. Um, it's about professional development. So we're very in touch, very engaged. These women have become my friends. Um, I've become their friends. Uh, some of them, their kids, or my godchildren. Uh, it's just, I talked to the woman I've mentored for the last 10 years today. I met her when she first came out of prison. Um, she has since gotten her master's degree. I'll never forget, I was one of three people invited to her graduation from college. And in, at, the, at the Madison Square Garden, her mother said to me before her mother died, her mother said, Joy, what is that after Leslie's name? And I said, it's Magna Cum Laude. She goes, what does that mean? I said, you know, she's a really smart girl. Uh, and then her mom passed. Uh, and so I've been there for every graduate. Yeah, her mom knew that she wasn't that girl that went to jail, um, that made a mistake. Um, and she's like, you know, when you came into her life, you were the first positive person that came into her life. I just talked to Leslie today, because um, she's, she's continued to thrive. She actually, actually, we have a Clinton Global Institute asked us to start working inside the jails. And so we launched a program four months ago at Rikers. So we are in Rikers. That's because Orange is the New Black, the TV well, you know, shows. We were on Orange, Orange is the New Black, you know? Love it. If you're into, if you're into <laughs> Orange is the New Black, what I didn't realize until I read the book is that we actually used to go to Danbury Prison, and we met Piper, and we used to go there and work at Danbury Prison. So we have now a program at Rikers. And Leslie, the same woman I've been mentoring for 10 years, is our um, consultant and works at Rikers working with the women. And so she was talking to me today about some of the successes at Rikers and some of the women and what's been doing, what we've been doing at Rikers. So 
It's really powerful, really powerful to, to bring wonderful people into your life. Marilyn? Hi, Marilyn Avalos. Uh, yeah, these stories are quite wonderful and very emotional and moving and all that sort of thing. But when you sell your story and pitch your story to, to donors and funders, do you uh, have a uh, do you track uh, how many women you've dressed and their success rate and where they are? Do you have numbers, basically? We yeah. Well, we're in a world now. I mean, one of the one of one of the things that's changed greatly in the nonprofit sector is accountability. Right. <laughs> so when I first started, right, you could tell a great story and a person would write a check. But now you have to have measurable outcomes. You know, you have to have you have to have data to support. And so one of our biggest funders and. Yay! Today we got the check from Walmart Foundation for $2.5 million. Uh, Yay! We ran it to the bank, right? We were just scanning it. It didn't seem believable, right? So we need them to see the watermark on the check so they don't think we're doing anything crazy and come back with a fraud alert. Um, but Walmart, quite frankly, Walmart Foundation taught us how to um, track and um, monitor the work that we're doing so that we can get other funding streams um, out there to support our work. So yeah, we have some great data. Um, we have a program through Walmart that we started for the woman who comes in and gets the suit and can't find employment. So we reach out to every woman. How did it go this week? How was your interview? Oh, it didn't work. Would you join our Going Places program? So it's an eight-week curriculum where we really focus on the job search and we make the job search a full-time job for her. So. You're going to land a job, it's a full-time job, it's not a part-time job, you're going to do it. 40 hours a week, you're going to be focused. So we bring her in once a week and we take her through this program. When we first started that program, we said to Walmart, when they gave us the big check, 30% of those women will find employment in eight weeks. Today, 70% of our Jeez. women find employment in eight weeks. We're aggressive. The times have changed, there's more jobs out there, but we're helping our women find employment. So we've got some great numbers. Not only do they land jobs, but do they get raises? Uh, do they get promotions? The do they find other jobs? Do they go back to website. school? Um, I monitor everything. I monitor do their kids finish college, high school? Because that's all connected to her success. It's dotted line to her success, what happens to her children in many cases. Um, because that's what my mother did for me. So I am a perfect example. Score of lady, success. what's your name, please? <laughs> <laughs> Nadine Chino. And, okay. and thank you. I feel so Barantasaurus like with <laughs> you. You're a symbol of success. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my question is, so as um, an impact entrepreneur and the CEO of Tiger Box Systems, we've actually employed um, some gentlemen who had come from uh, a state of incarceration. Tiger Box. Tiger Box. Tiger Box. We help companies reduce their moving costs and packaging impacts to people and planet by renting a reusable moving system that replaces cardboard entirely and it results in a 30% reduction in their moving costs because our system stacks five high instead of cardboard traditionally stacking three. And so since the inception of our company in 1991, way before green was the new black, so we don't want to, you know, orange is the new black, green is the new black, yeah. we don't want to compete on the black situation. However, I want to say we have saved over 20 million trees from being destroyed, all positive impacts from a simple box. It's right. just overlooked in the ubiquitousness of how we live. So with that having been said, we've actually hired some gentlemen from the CEO organization, which I think is here. Oh, all right. We know the house. And so you know, being the liberal New Yorker, la la la, you know, everybody makes mistakes and yes. that's our attitude. Look at my balance sheet, you're going to see all the mistakes I've made. So this just depends on where the mistakes show up. Right. How, though, because it takes a lot to for a woman to have come from incarceration to get on an interview, especially if she's not hired the first time, How do you, what are the supports that you provide to her? How do you really encourage her to get past the stigma? And how do you encourage employers to give them a shot? Would the CEO want to answer that? This oh, is the work that okay. they do. <laughs> yes, and we also, I'm oh, sorry, my Same name is Tanaya is. Mills, and I work at the Center for Employment Opportunities, and we work with Dress for Success. We've been a partner with them for a very long time. We yeah. work with both men and women coming home from prison. 
Um, and we have a training program, we have a transitional employment program, we try to do everything we need to, we work with you. Um, great company to, to work for. And you also helped us move. Yes, we did. So, sorry, I'm digressing. <laughs> but just to answer your question about our clients are coming directly from prison, coming right out. They may have been out of prison for two or three days. They come directly to us. And it's all about that initial engagement. It's all about what Joy was just talking about making sure that people trying to build that trust with individuals because they trust no one when people come home from prison because any encounters that they have have not been really good ones with society even though they've tried to do their best to do their time so really trying to get them engaged with them giving them that um, that support when they first come home really talking to them developing a resume and trying to get them to work as quickly as we can that's why it's so great when we have employers like you and one thing about um, ticket box is that we work with a lot of employers who don't necessarily want to publicly say they work with people who are coming home from prison. And so that's the other stigma because of public relation issues. Uh, but once they get the job, we can connect people. But we always have to support them because it's not just about getting the job, it's about helping them keep the job. And yeah. having the support and staff to make sure that um, you're continually working with them, bringing them once a week. They come to us four days a week. I'm sorry, we, uh, we send them out on our transition work site four days a week, and one day a week they're working with a job coach or a job developer uh, to get them out. And as Joyce said, it's not just their client, it's their children. We're working with parole officers or probation officers. Uh, we also had a program years ago out of Michael's Island. So it takes what they say, as Hillary Clinton said, it takes a whole village. But you've got to stay connected, you've got to be authentic, and you've got to be true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for sure. But again, if I could just add yeah. on to that, so as a company that provides a product for the, for the moving and storage industry, many contracts, both city, state, and federal, kind of almost have a ban on if there is a, 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 a prison record. Yes. They don't want them yes. on the job. So yes. how do we Especially as a community? Well, well, and okay. one of the things that's great. We're a community great. here, yes. right? How do we yes. overcome that? Well, one of the great things in New York City and also in Buffalo, New York, the city council, I just happen to be responsible for external legislative affairs as well. Um, is that they have an act that's now in front of the city council they want to pass called the Fair Chance Act. The oh, Fair Chance yeah. Act, um, which upstate New York and other places across the country, is it's called the Ban the Box. And basically what it does is give individuals, and we're not saying that the person should not indicate that they are a former offender. Because one thing at CEO, we want to make sure the employee knows at the time they're about to hire who they're working with. We try to get full disclosure. But the Ban the Box or the Fair Chance Act what that gives the person an opportunity is that when they're applying for the job, so they're banning, there's no question, have you ever been convicted on your first application, right? It's only at the point when the employer is about to make a decision that Tanai may be an ex I'm sorry, my name is Tanai Mills, Tanai, they can then ask, have you had any um, connection with the criminal justice system? But at the point they're getting ready to make a decision, and that gives me an opportunity a fair chance leveling the playing field to be able to have that discussion. But you're right, there's still discrimination, there's still stereotype, stereotyping or stereotypical situations that happen. Um, but in New York State, we're doing the bad box. And so if I think that we can all get behind that movement, some employers are afraid, um, they're afraid of risk, and we could have a whole other discussion about risk. Um, to an employer, but there's no more risk than hiring someone who has a that who has a criminal history than anybody else. So that someone wants to get in touch with you. What's yes. Um, again, I'm with the Center for Employment Opportunities. My email address is tmills at CEO Works. We're down, and and was important for us. Our offices are down by our 50 Broad, Broadway, which is down by the Wall Street because we also wanted to make the clients feel that this is really the, the, the hub of where people work and so making them feel good. So you can, I'll leave my information. Nancy has it, we're members of the chamber. Uh, we have a couple of more questions. Thank you. I think we have time for one or two more questions and I think everybody should continue the dialogue and switch cards. And who's not a member of the Manhattan Chamber? Okay, you must sign up. That's number one. <laughs> uh, when it influence again, we did form this because of joy. What? There you go. Okay, joy. Uh, any more questions? Uh, let's go back. Is there a similar Name? organization for men? Yeah, there is. There's an organization that grew out of us when we first started. It's called Career Gear. 
and they're in Wall Street. So careergear.org is the organization, and uh, I don't know if CEO work with career here, yes, but yes, Gary but they Fields. charge for their suits. I know, no. they, I know, mm -hmm. I know. Just like you guys. You know what, they charge, they charge, you mean they charge, they charge they, not the person, they charge the agency. Um, for, we don't charge, we don't charge anyone. We don't charge our agency partners, we don't charge the women. But listen, all of us have a plethora of clothing at our offices, and what we need is funding. And so this is their way of getting funding so that they can support the men. And um, and so with the men, let me tell you, they have some of the greatest suits over there here. So <laughs> suits, ties, whatever. A guy can have one suit and three ties and look like a different person every single day. Of his life, um, I know it because my husband won't get rid of his suit. <laughs> um, but it's a great organization, and they largely work with a lot of ex-offenders. Um, but they also work with any man who needs employment, career gear. Yeah, I saw hands going up. Uh, anybody else? Lainey? Oh. This is a. It, I don't know if it's an appropriate question. It may Inappropriate? Be, no, I don't know if oh. it's appropriate. Okay. <laughs> it's personal and a little bit provocative. Ooh. It's when you when you. Talk Personal and provocative, she said. <laughs> when you talked about Walmart, I'm a diehard, like Nadine, I'm a diehard New York liberal. And this just came up this morning, actually, on Morning Joe, where they were talking about the Koch brothers. And Mika was talking about one of the Koch brothers' wives who's doing this incredible work with young people in education. And I have a really hard time with, I mean, you know, it doesn't, that doesn't matter, but it really raised a lot of questions for me, and then you talked about Walmart, which has, oh, sure, you they know, there's a certain issues with the way they treat their workers, and they have absolutely have had some blemishes in the past, but I, what I will tell you about Walmart, see, I don't know what happened in those stores with their employees, but what I will tell you about Walmart is that the women, the most senior level women at Walmart, it's called the Women's Officers Caucus. They, they are the mentors to our clients around the world. They chose, so they mentor every month. I'm talking women who have billions of dollars of accountability. They do a phone call every month with one of our women to help her, help herself. And that's their pledge. So their corporation has decided that we today care about women in the workplace. I want to add to that. And so they have invested a lot of money into the not-for-profits that are doing workforce development, um, and especially those nonprofits whose focus is on women in the workplace. And um, and we are extremely grateful because, because of them, they are allowing us to do real impact in communities that we would have never been able to get into. Um, so it's only in America is where their funding is focused on, not um, outside of America, not for the Walmart family. I'm on the board of women's president organization. Many of you are members. It's a great organization. You can get joy in there. However, Sam's Club very much is trying to do that initiative with us as well. Because they're really yeah, phenomenal. Right. Yeah, but, yeah. Right. So, this has been phenomenal, I think. Yes, we all enjoyed yeah. ourselves. Yeah. Yes. Coming yeah. back yeah. again. Okay. Yes, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, dressforsuccess.org is our email address, and you can figure out which office in the New York City area. But the one in Manhattan is on 31st between Park and Madison. <laughs> you have to go up. I'm telling you. If there's one trip, you have to do at lunch and bring your friends. You will not believe it. I'm telling you, you will not believe it. That's how I make it. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. Well done. Well done.